Hi there, this is Competent Communicator's Speech 10. The title of my speech is The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. How long would it take you to spell the words I love you if you could only communicate by blinking your left eye? For most of us, this will thankfully never be an issue. But for a Frenchman named Jean-Dominique Bobby, blinking became his only means of communicating with the world. The life of Jean Doe, as he was known to those close to him, was divided into two distinct halves. For the first half, he was a respected journalist, a flamboyant Parisian, who presided over a world-famous fashion magazine. But the 8th of December 1995 proved to be a fateful turning point in the life of Jean Doe. While spending a weekend in the French countryside with his young son, he suddenly suffered a brain hemorrhage and had to be rushed into hospital. When he finally awoke several weeks later, his mental faculties had returned, but he had suffered complete paralysis. His body was a dead weight. He couldn't speak and he couldn't communicate. All his faculties, bar his hearing, were intact, but the only thing he could move was his left eye. His right eye had been sewn shut with stitches to prevent an infection. Working with a speech therapist, he developed a system of communicating by blinking his left eye. The person talking to him ran through an alphabet chart and he would blink when they approached the right letter. Conversations required slow, painstaking progress. Finally, his family and friends could communicate with a man trapped inside his own non-responsive body, but he was faced with countless long, empty hours of solitude, and the prospects of his recovery were depressingly slim. His dreams of producing a great work of literature, and the feelings of frustration and helplessness his condition understandably caused in him needed an outlet. And so this book, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, was born. He began to compose whole sentences and passages of text in his head, to use his own words. In my head I turn over every sentence ten times, delete a word, add an adjective, and learn my text by heart, paragraph by paragraph. Then, each morning when his transcriber, a lady named Claude, arrived, he would dictate the paragraphs he'd composed and learn letter by letter. Each day's work would typically yield a couple of sentences. Within four months, the book, numbering 139 pages in its English translation, was complete. But what a brilliant work of literature it was. A hauntingly slim volume, it will live long in the memory of those who read it. It charts John Doe's incarceration at a strange hospital by the desolate French coast. It paints pictures of his former lovers and his jet-setting lifestyle. It touchingly relates family visits where he senses his children's unease at his condition and it narrates his daydreams as his mind roams free through the passages of space and time. The book's met title is a metaphor for this mental freedom. For while Jean Doe's body remained as heavy and inert as a diving bell, his mind soared free like a butterfly. One of, this re one of the reasons this book struck a chord with me was the time which it narrates. I can remember a lot of the things I was doing in December 1995. It was an exciting year. I was growing up. I was 14 years old and approaching the end of high school. I was discovering girls, I was playing piano, and I enjoyed greater freedom in my home life. Soon I would get my first job and earn up £20 a week which I could spend however I liked. I was preoccupied with teenage things, oblivious to this story which was developing in an isolated wing of a French hospital. A man who had already lived his life had been tragically severed from his past and was now looking back in confusion, but his light continued to burn. It's so inspiring to realise what the human spirit is capable of. The graceful nature of the prose in this book, and the vivid, vivid imagery Jean Doe conjures up reflect the lengthy gestation period in every single page must have undergone in his head. The book beautifully explains his perspective and his relationship with the various hospital workers charged with his care. He shares an obvious bond with a speech therapist who developed his means of communicating, and with the physiotherapist who regularly checks his body for signs of recovery. He angrily berates the brutish, uncaring doctor who sewed his right eyelid shut. He marvels at the wrong turns of his wheelchair as an order orderly pushes him past smells of food from the kitchen. He curses the man who turned off the TV halfway through a football game he was watching. The front cover features a picture of a lighthouse. The lighthouse is an important symbol of hope in the book. Jean Doe is frequently wheeled to a window overlooking a lighthouse that stands amidst windswept sand dunes. In his eyes, the sun the lighthouse comes to represent his guardian of the sick, and it acts as a focal point for his prayers of recovery. He writes, As we emerged from a lift, 
having got off on the wrong floor, I saw it, tall, robust and reassuring, in red and white stripes that reminded me of a rugby shirt. I at once placed myself under the protection of this brotherly symbol, guardian not just of sailors but of the sick, those castaways on the shores of loneliness. The climax of the book relates Jean Doe's last hours of old freedom on that fateful day of the 8th of December 1995. In the morning, he noticed the Beatles song, A Day in the Life, playing on the radio. His work had arranged for him to test drive a new BMW. He was planning to take his son to the theatre. The onset of his stroke is hauntingly played out against the orchestral crescendo of this very famous Beatles song. Ultimately, this story had a bittersweet ending. John Doe's condition was never to improve. Two days after the book was published, in 1997, he passed away from an infection. Subsequently, the book rocketed to the top of bestseller lists worldwide. The Financial Times called it one of the great books of the century. It was his dream that this book be turned into a movie, and this too eventually transpired in 2008. The movie version of The Diving Bell and the Butterfly has gone on to win countless awards at the Cannes Film Festival and the Golden Globes, and received four Oscar nominations. This book has taught me many things. It has demonstrated the value of dreaming. It reminds us of the rich tapestry of human imagination. It has proved that everyone has a story worth telling, and it demonstrates to me that everybody has something in them that can inspire other people. None of us really know what form our future will take, or whether our lives will remain the same at the end of each day as they begin in the morning. And while it's easy to read a book like this and then spout cliches like live for the moment, or be thankful for what you've got, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly is a timely reminder of the richness the variety and the endless possibility of the human experience.